Good evening and a welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Those of you that are watching on our live stream, welcome. Let's all stand as we turn the page number 413. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Humble master of the sea, heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe and fine. Love lifted me, love lifted me, and now we As we turn to page number 431, save, save.
be seated. Amen. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you, God, that we can have church. God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me uh, 12 years ago, Lord. And God, I just thank you, Lord, for the day you saved me, Lord, and how good you were to me. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be with tonight's service. Father, be with the singing, Lord. I pray that you be with the preaching of your word, Lord. I pray, God, that you would be with those that are watching through the live stream, Lord. I pray that you would minister to their hearts. And God, I pray that if there's someone watching that is not saved, Lord, I pray, God, that they would get saved tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for a place where we can meet and worship you in and fellowship. God, I pray that you be with the rest of the service. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go to our next song. Our next song, page number 439. 439, Stepping in the Light. sing our next song, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our song picks for tonight. Uh, we already have one from the live stream, which is what a friend we have in Jesus. Did any more come in, Brother Kyle? All right. Anybody here have a song that you want to sing here tonight? We'll sing them after the offertory. Anybody have a song that you want to sing here tonight? Kyle? Page number 20. Anybody going once? Going twice? All right, we're going to move on to our next song, page number 441, page number 441, Sunlight. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today.
announcements. First, we'd like to congratulate the Jersey Shore Baptist, Baptist Academy graduates, Sophia Acosta and Sayla Mears, and Lily Olive, who graduated eighth grade. Sophia and Sayla graduated kindergarten, so we praise the Lord for that. And also want to remind everyone, if you're planning on att attending any of our services here, 8.30 a.m. service, the 5 o'clock service, and the Wednesday night Bible study, make sure you go on our website, jerseyshorebaptist.com, and you register for the service so we can prepare for you here in the auditorium. And then also, don't, don't forget to update your contact information right on our website so we have up-to-date information to make sure that we reach out to you. Don't forget about our noon Zoom prayer meeting. That's Monday through Saturday at 12 o'clock, and we've been doing that for the past couple of months now, and it's been a, a great time of fellowship and praying with God's people, and if you want a link to that, you want to join us through Zoom, just reach out to Pastor or to Sammy, and we'll make sure you get that, or you can tune in on Facebook Live, and then our blood drive is going to be June 23rd here at the church from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., and please consider giving uh, our nation, there's a nationwide shortage of blood. And you can register on redcrossblood.org. You can look up the church's name or type in the zip code, and you can um, get an appointment there to donate blood, go through the questionnaire so you don't have to wait here when you come in. That's June 23rd, 1 p.m. through 6 p.m. And right before we take up our offering, just want to remind those at home, you can give online on our website. You can gl click on the giving uh, link there, and then you can also text to give. You can mail in your offering, and our offering plate is right on the baptistry here for those that are, are with us in the auditorium. Let's pray for the offering and continue on with the service. Lord, we thank you, God, for tonight. Thank you, God, for how good you've been to us, Lord. We thank you, God, for meeting the needs of a church, Lord. And God, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do that. God, I pray, Lord, for our missionaries, Lord. I pray, God, that you would continue to provide for them. And God, I pray that you would continue to provide for our church here and Father, we pray, Lord, that you would be with those that give, Lord. I pray that we'd give cheerfully unto you. God, you're so faithful to us. I pray that we'd be faithful to you. I pray, God, that you'd be with the remainder of the service. Father, Lord, we love you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to do our song picks. I'm going to add one, Miss Camilla. We're going to add number 57, which is at Calvary. So right now we're going to turn our hymn books to page number 20. Page number 20, I'm standing on the solid rock. Now I'm pressing onward, it's the pitch me homeward. 
go to page number 57. Page number 57 at Calvary. Years I spent
anybody here have a testimony? I'd like to uh, recognize uh, what you all said before the last time. Um, I first want to say that I thank the Lord for the services this morning. Uh, you know, I know it's difficult uh, for the people that have to, you know, take all this down. I mean, the 830 service is here, and then we move everything outside. And we don't have it. We have a portable system, but we don't, it's not, it's not strong enough for, so we take all of this stuff outside. And um, it's a lot of work, and they have the Sunday school hour to do it. And it's a little rough on the equipment. Larry will tell you, it's, uh, our, our equipment's getting a little bit beat up. Um, you know, the soundboard uh, needs a little bit of work. We lost one of the uh, stands that stand there. If you, if you bounce into that thing, that camera's gonna fall on your head. That phone is gonna fall on your head. That went over this morning and broke. So it's a little rough on the equipment, but praise the Lord, it's good that we were able to do it and everything went well. And I'm not sure, honestly, uh, what we're gonna be doing next week. Um, I don't know if we'll be live, if we'll be outside again at 11 o'clock. We will have the Lord willing, we will have an 8.30 service and an 11 o'clock service. The 8.30 service will be inside. The 11 o'clock service, I don't know for sure if we'll be outside or inside. I like to do the outside only because I don't, I don't know if we're ready to do nurseries and junior church and all that stuff so people with kids can, can you know, come with uh, the kids in the car. So I'm really not sure uh, what, what's going to happen. We'll kind of, you know, take it day by day, see what happens. And then, of course, the weather's a factor. And uh, as Isan announced, Wednesday, we're going to try to do some kind of a junior church or a kids club program outside for our kids. Not, we're not going to pick anybody up. But, uh, but, you know, I appreciate everybody's patience and flexibility, you know, because it's been, it's been crazy. It's just a crazy time that we're living in. And now, if the pandemic wasn't bad enough, we got all this chaos going on in the major cities with all the racial stuff going on. And it's just... It's just a nightmare, and you just never know what you're going to wake up to. And, uh, you know, I'm 55, and for 55 years, my life has been pretty steady outside of 9-11. Uh, I don't remember JFK or Martin Luther King. That was, uh, I'm not sure when did JFK, was that 60, 62? So that was before my time. I wouldn't remember that. M Martin Luther King was after, my, after that, though, right? So I don't remember any of that. 9-11 was the only thing I remember as being this big, major cataclysmic event and I think I mean I don't like to make comparisons on bad things but this seems to be worse as far as the effect that it's having on everybody and and certainly you know the effect it's having on the churches so but praise the Lord you're here we're here and uh, we're able to you know figure something out and uh, the noon zoom has been helpful we've been able to contact you know stay in contact with uh, we average probably about 30 people a day on the on the zoom uh, prayer thing, and, and that's great. So as far as I know, uh, we have, nobody's fallen off the planet yet or off the edge of the cliff. Everybody's still good uh, that was part of this church before this all got started. So I praise the Lord for all that. Anybody else have a testimony? Larry? I just want to thank God um, for that song that we just sung a year ago uh, today or on the Sunday. We actually sung that song. My sister just uh, gave birth to a baby. sister's doing doing a lot a lot better now too and um just to see where she was before this happened to her to how much closer she is to god and how tragedy uh brings us closer to god and, and god was there with her the whole time and if you talk to her now she she knows that god was right there with her and it uh, brought her closer to god and those things in our lives that we're going through 
um, every single week, every day. I mean, everybody's different. Everybody's got different things going on in their life. And, um, but God's putting those things. Today, you, you, were, you were saying about distractions and how uh, sometimes God allows distractions in your life. And it's so true. Sometimes he does trying to get us closer to him right. or trying to stop us from doing something we shouldn't do. And I just want to thank God that uh, no matter if we can't see it or we can see it or however it is in our lives, any trial situation that we're going through, uh, that one of the promises in, in the Bible is that, uh, that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And he's always right there with us. He's always, he's always holding our hand through the whole process, whether we like it or not. Um, that's just the Christian life. Sometimes we're going to go through things. And I just thank God that he is there, that I can look back in, in, in times in my life and know I would not have got through that if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for God. In my sister's life, she would not have been able to get through that if God wasn't there. And it's just comforting to know that God is there with you. Amen. It's good. Anybody else? Sam. Well, this year, we had our official last day party type deal on Friday. And um, last summer, I was a mess regarding the school. And I just didn't know what the Lord was going to do and how it was all going to work out. And looking back, I can just see him laughing because little did we know halfway through the year, we were just <laughs> going to get shut down anyway. But um, I just praise the Lord how he worked it all out. And um, just... I think about all the worry that I had, and uh, now looking at it, it was just unnecessary. And um, I just praise the Lord because he always comes through, and he always makes it better than you expected, and you just, you just don't need to worry about it. It's not in your hands anyway. So, yeah. But I just praise the Lord that everything went well, and, and um, that Sayla went through kindergarten, and she did amazing, and um, Sophia as well. And uh, I just praise the Lord just all in all how it went. You know, it just brings up a thought, you know. Imagine in the beginning of the year, we're thinking about all the things we're going to do and all what was going to take place this year, and God's just up there. <laughs> you think so, huh? Where do you find out what's going to happen? It's crazy. So last year, I was telling Brother Mike, last year, a year ago, was when we had the, the, the ordination thing for Phil. Remember that? And the, I mean, it was just packed out, and now look. It's like there's there's nobody here, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's it's just crazy what a year will bring. So, but praise the Lord, God is good, and uh, you know I told the church this morning we might be we might be back there in a couple weeks in the in the backwoods. We got a spot cleared out back there, about three acres back, and uh, so who knows that might be the place where we meet, hide the car someplace or something. I don't know. So, anybody else? Yeah, James. I used to go to a Toastmasters meeting with this uh, guy several years back, uh, which that's like a public speaking class. And uh, I just got an email. It was a GoFundMe and uh, found out that he's got multiple myeloma, which is uh, bone marrow cancer. And uh, it's just crazy to know that this was somebody that I was associated with. Like, he's not like the best friend or anything like that, but I knew of him and he was a nice guy. And, uh, you know, uh, just finding out that he's really probably only got a few weeks left to life. Um, and uh, just, I've been praying for him. I would ask that you guys pray for him, too. His name's Joe. And um, he's got a son that uh, he's raising money for, for LASIK. And they're almost at the goal. They're about there. Um, he said it was his one gift that he wanted to give to him. But it's just a reminder to me, once again, like you said, you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Um, but I thank God for the um, songs that he puts in our heart and the joy. And I, I know there's people hurting out there right now, but, and I'm not trying to rub this in anybody's face, but right now I'm not hurting at all. God's taking care of me. He's taking care of my family. I'm just thankful that he takes care of uh, his children when the world may seem like it's falling apart. But really, he's got our backs, and he's preparing us for something. I don't know what it is, but uh, he still got us here for a reason. I just thank him for how good he is. Chapter 12. And we're just going through the, uh, First and Second Samuel, and we're, we're kind of following the life of David. And uh, back in... 2 Samuel 10, actually, we, we were talking about the fact that David went to war with the, 
the nation of Ammon over really a stupid thing. Um, the, the son of the king, the, the king dies, Naash, and the son takes over, and David just sends some ambassadors over, really with a get well card, or with a, with a bereavement card, you know, just wanting to encourage him and to be kind to him and to pay his respects. And this new king, um, Hanan, his counselors tell him that David is just trying to spy on you. He's just he's he's not doing this to be kind. He's doing this because he wants to he wants to conquer you. And that none of that was true. We talked about that being fake news. There's a lot of fake news flying around. Things that people think and say and repeat that just aren't true. And it ended up breaking out into this great big war. And of course, we knew in chapter 10 that he conquers. Ammon, but he doesn't only conquer Ammon, he conquers the Syrians and, and other nations that w ended up being confederate with the Ammonites. And then in chapter 11 and 12, we kind of get a little bit of detail that, of things that are going on be behind the scenes um, while that battle was going on. And so we talked about the causes, we're talking about David and Bathsheba, and we talked about the causes of David's sin, and we found out last week that it was at the time when kings go forth to battle, and that battle was with the Ammonites. And so this was the battle referred to that came about as a result of this bad decision this, this Hanan made uh, in chapter 10. And so this battle is going on. David wasn't at the battle. He wasn't where he was supposed to be, and, and a lot of other reasons we talked about. Now, in chapter 12, we're going to talk about the consequences of David's sin. Um, when we got to the end of chapter 11, David had everything pretty well cleaned up, he thought. Um, he had, uh, uh, he, he had the, the child was on its way, and the, um, the Uriah was dead, nobody was going to know. And uh, he thought he had it all cleaned up and all covered up. And the last phrase we see in, in chapter 11 is, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And so here's chapter 12 deals with all of the consequences or the beginning of the consequences. And there are many more consequences that are going to follow as a result of David's uh, sin, you know, initially with Bathsheba, then the sin with Uriah the Hittite. And this is all pretty familiar ground for all of us, but it's good to be reminded of these truths uh, over and over again. And so I want to begin reading in verse 9 of chapter 12. And because it deals more with the consequences, we'll back up a little bit after that and talk about how it was exposed. But in, in chapter 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and has taken the wife of Uriah against thee out of thine own house, and I will take, notice this, thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in thy sight, in the sight of this son, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And you know, uh, I just think about that verse where it talks about you know, the things that are whispered in the ears will be shouted upon the housetops. And there's a lot of people sneaking around. You know, there's a lot of little maybe private sin going on in an individual's life. And then there's the, you know, sin where people are, you know, sneaking around together or whatever. Uh, but all that stuff eventually is going to come out. Um, verse 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord... And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath also put away thy sin. Um, thou shalt not die. Praise the Lord for that. He put away the sin. By the way, the interesting thing, and this is not in the message, but the difference between Saul and David, God told Saul, I put you away. And it's interesting, that phrase. You know, the Bible talks about being put away. That's, it's, it's, almost, it's divorce. God hateth putting away, Malachi says. God told Saul, I'm going to put you away. But with David, I mean, Saul committed spiritual adultery, uh, going to the witch of Endor and all that, and all these other things that he was guilty of. God said, I'll put you away. But with David, 
He said, I'm going to put your sin away. Um, uh, but he says, you, you'll not die. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given, notice this, great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? In other words, if David was a wreck before the child died, how bad is he going to be now that he finds out the child is dead? When David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set before him, set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And so, um, you know, just a very, very sad story. And every time I go through this, you know, one of the, uh, I guess in this case, it would be a disadvantage of being saved for a long period of time and reading through your Bible you know, every year, several times, uh, not, not several times in a year, but every year we're, we're on a Bible reading schedule to read through the year, and every time I come to this chapter in the Scripture, I'm like, David, don't do it. What are you doing? Don't, you know, this is stupid. Um, you know, you're, you're a great guy. Um, you're a man after God's own heart. I mean, Psalms are replete with all the praises and worship that David offered up to God, but David was human like the rest of us, and David... Um, committed this tragic sin, and as a result, there were so many consequences. Now, go back to chapter 12 and verse 1, and just real quick, and we should have probably read it initially. I don't know why I broke it up like this, but it is what it is. And look at verse 1, and we'll see how God exposed the sin, um, in, in, you know, regarding David um, with this parable, if you will, that this uh, Nathan, the prophet, brings to him. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David right after it said the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And um, so the Nathan goes to David and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And notice David is upset about this. I mean, it's not clicking. He doesn't get it yet. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore, or excuse me, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall, shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and I delivered out of the hand of Saul and I gave him uh, I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? And so it's just a tragic, tragic story. Now I want to just think about 
two principles regarding sin. And, and again, there are so many things that we could say about sin, but just two principles regarding sin, and we alluded to these already. First of all, all sin will be exposed. All sin will be exposed. Um, back in Numbers chapter 32, um, the Bible says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And then Moses said, be sure your sin will find you out. And it's interesting, the context of that story was when the children of Israel were ch traveling through Moab and Edom, or Edom, Moab, and Ammon, and they were about to cross over into the Jordan River. They had conquered some of the, some of the countries on the eastern side of the Jordan River, and two and a half of the tribes actually claimed some of the land there, and they asked Moses, they said, look, we like it over here. Can we stay over on this side? And Moses at first got very upset. And the reason why Moses got upset was because he thought that those men that were part of those two and a half tribes, that they were going to stay there, and then they were not going to go across the Jordan River to fight with their brethren, the other tribes of Israel, to conquer the Canaanites on the other side of the river. In other words, he thought, okay, you guys, you fought your battle, you like this land over here, you want to stay here, and you don't want to come over and fight with us. And he says, if you do that, he says, you're going to discourage your brothers, your, the other tribes. You're going to discourage them. And by doing so, you're sinning against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. That's the context behind that. And uh, it's just an interesting story. And they had no intention of doing that. They were going to go over and fight. And when the battles were all won, they were going to come back and, and establish their land and, and everything else. But the bottom line is, is all sin will be exposed. In Luke chapter 12, the Bible says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. In Galatians chapter 6, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so it's just... There's just something about the devil has us duped into thinking that we can sin against God and nobody's going to find out about it. And it's just not the case. It will be revealed eventually. And um, it's just something we need to just have that in the back of our mind whenever the temptation to sin comes in. Realize that someday somebody else besides just you and God will be viewing this thing and seeing what's going on. Secondly, all sin has consequences. Um, I remember going to um, the RU when we did the RU program here years ago, and they had uh, all of those principles. And the ninth principle in the RU program is God chooses those consequences. Those consequences are up to God. Uh, sometimes we'd like to choose our own consequences, and I think we would be uh, a little bit... Uh, uh, more lenient than God is. Uh, God sometimes comes, did you ever notice this about God? God comes down extremely hard about some things. And like, like, you know, there are some things in the Bible I thought God would have got really upset about. And he didn't. But there were other things in the Bible that didn't seem like a real big deal to me. But God got really upset about them. Like when David numbered the people, remember that? There were all the people that died as a result of David numbering the people. And to me, it was like, what's the big deal? We number people all the time. We're counting all, all the time. And I get there's a difference, but I'm just saying, to God, that was something he got really, really upset about. But God chooses the consequences. And the purpose of the message tonight really is to examine the consequences of David's sin and let those consequences really serve as a warning to me, to serve as a warning to you. Number one, one of the consequences that happened to David and will happen to us is we are publicly humiliated. The fact that we're still talking about David and Bathsheba after several thousand years is a testimony to the fact that, that one of the consequences of sin is public humiliation. I mean, you know, we're still mentioning, we're still bringing this up after all these years. Every time we fall into sin, it mars our reputation permanently. However, we can do some things that will partially repair our reputation. For instance, regarding David. David is known for his sin with Bathsheba, but he is also known for killing the giant. He's also called a man after God's own heart. He also did a lot of wonderful things. 
So his life isn't completely characterized by the sin. He did make up for the sin, not make up for the sin. The sin, nothing can make up for sin, but he did do some things that did improve his reputation. And David did a lot of things that repaired and improved his re uh, reputation. Bathsheba also, I mean, she's famous for this illicit affair, but it very well could be that she's the virtuous woman spoken of in Proverbs 31. Uh, some theologians believe that, you know, Solomon actually wrote all of those Proverbs, and even though they attributed the last several chapters are attributed to two other men, many believe that they're just pseudonyms that Solomon used um, in writing those. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it isn't true. But if it is true, Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. And Bathsheba is the virtuous woman, and we really don't think of Bathsheba as being a virtuous woman, although we really don't know fully all the circumstances regarding the sin. I don't, I don't think she was raped. I, I, I don't get the idea. It wasn't consensual, but um, maybe there was just a lot of pressure put on her from the king and from the king's servants. But the bottom line is this, is there's public humiliation um, regarding sin. And when we fall into sin, and all of us are sinners, and, and please don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm saying here. We're all sinners. We've all blown it. We've all done things that we regret. There's, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We're all in that category. Um, however, you, you kind of understand what I'm talking about. There are certain sins that I don't know if God, in God's eyes, well, there is a degree of sin. Uh, Jesus did say, thou hast committed the greater sin. And so there is degrees of sin. I, the littlest sin is enough to send somebody to hell. But the point I'm trying to make is this, is in God's sight, sin is sin. It's all bad. It's all horrible. And we need to make sin exceedingly sinful. But in man's eyes, there are, there are some sins that are just bigger than others. And, and when we cross into those areas, they're just areas that tend to travel with us forever no matter what we do, to try to get things right with the Lord and with other people. And um, listen, if you've fallen into sin and you've been humiliated publicly, I would encourage you to allow the experience to humble you and make you a better person. People are still going to talk, and by the way, that's part of the consequences. Let them talk. And I've given up a long time ago in trying to cover anything. I mean, it is what it is. Take me at face value. If I blow it, I blow it. And if I make a mistake, I'll tell you. And, and because I'd rather personally let you know myself when I blew it rather than have you dig it up somewhere. And so, uh, you know, but if it, it's just part of the consequences and it's okay. Humbling is a good process to go through. Uh, you, you probably, I don't know, man, most of you probably haven't read this book or not. Maybe you have. I was required reading when I was in the public school. But how many of you ever read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne? You can tell who the public school people, Christian school kids don't have to read that book. Did you have to read in Christian school? Really? Did any of you guys read it? You read it in Christian school? Oh, really? So Christian schools would put their stamp of approval on that. Okay. Uh, but anyway, it's a great book. I just read it recently again. I just pulled that out and read it again. And you remember the story, I mean, you know, what was her name? Hester, or was that the daughter's name? I forget which one it was. Hester Prynne, whatever. And then there was the Reverend Dimmesdale. He was the guilty party. And he was the one that did it, but nobody knew he did it. And, and, and here it's Hester. Was that her name? That was the mom. What was the daughter's name? You remember? No? I thought the daughter's name was Hester. But anyway, this, this lady who commits adultery has this child. Everybody knows she committed adultery because she had this child. And... Um, or at least they knew she committed fornication. They, I guess they couldn't know. But they, they put this scarlet A on everything she wears. And everywhere she goes, she's got this scarlet A. And she's publicly humiliated. But that's okay. She just kind of goes through life, and, and she continues to do well. Meanwhile, the guy that covered it up and tried to hide it, you know the story. His, he begins to get eaten out from the inside. It's like a debilitating disease that just keeps killing him and destroying him more and more as time goes on because he never got it right. And it's okay. You blow it. Get it right. Take the public humiliation, whatever it is. And just, listen, I hate to say it, but you could have the attitude, look, it was wrong. I blew it. I did it. But okay, we're going to move on. 
And I find that most people are very gracious when you have that kind of an attitude. It's when you try to cover things up that, that things get to be really a mess. So, you know, if you fall or if you have fallen, admit it, confess it. The people that talk the most, by the way, are usually the ones that have a bunch of skeletons in their own closets that they're trying to hide. And somehow they feel like if they talk about you and what you've done, it takes the pressure or the exposure off of them. And so use your experience, by the way, to warn others away from sin and to comfort and help restore others like yourself who have also fallen. But we, we, we will be publicly humiliated. Secondly, we deal with private guilt. Look at Psalm 51. We're not going to turn to too many scriptures tonight. I do have a couple of verses that I'm going to quote, but Psalm 51, and this, of course, is, you know, David's psalm of contrition regarding his guilt. And he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Notice, though, according to the Bible narrative in, in uh, 2 Samuel 12, he did not confess his sin until he was pointed out. Follow that. It's not like he came clean on his own. It wasn't until Nathan confronted him and exposed him. And sometimes we need to be confronted. Verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. And you know, you can't have joy until you get things right with God. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's where that humility comes in. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer books upon thine altar. So the cure to guilt is confession. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And by the way, I believe if you sinned against somebody, you need to confess it to them as well as confess it to God. David said also in Psalm 32, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgression unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now, of course, if you continue in the sin, the guilt will never go away no matter how many times you confess it. Some people, you know, continue down the same thing. They struggle with that same sin. Some people call it that besetting sin, and, and they keep confessing it over and over again, but the guilt will no, never go away. The Bible says, He that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. And so we need to not only confess, we need to forsake. But it will, it will uh, we'll deal with private guilt um, when we've, as part of the consequences of sin. And then also, we bring painful consequences to those we love. We involve others and therefore bring consequences upon them. When David gave in to his lust for Bathsheba, he brought a lot of other people into the sin. He brought Bathsheba into the sin. He brought the messengers, plural, that took her. He brought Joab into it because then he's got to get Joab involved uh, with Uriah the Hittite and all that. And Joab then becomes complicit in the whole affair. Um, remember when Peter went to, back to fishing? He says, I go a fishing. What's the next 
phrase say? We also go with thee. And so whenever you decide to leave the will of God and do your own thing, it affects other people. Achan's sin in the book of Joshua led to the defeat of the army of Israel at Ai. And it caused the death of, I think, 37 soldiers died at that battle, all because of Achan's sin. Not to mention the fact that his wife, his children, his extended family, Achan's family, they all died as a result of Achan's sin. All because he looked and he lusted and took of the goodly Babylonian garment, the wedge, wedges of silver and gold. And um, so his sin had negative effects, consequences to people that he loved. And when we do it, we bring those consequences to people we love. Everybody we bring with us into our sin will also have to answer to God and face his or her own consequences. But not only do we involve others and bring consequences upon them, we injure others that are completely innocent. Uriah was completely innocent. Think about Uriah. This guy did nothing. You read about Uriah and other portions when it's mentioning, mentioning the mighty man and all that. Uriah was a, he was a Hittite, first of all. So he wasn't even an Israelite, but yet he was loyal and faithful to David. He wouldn't even go and be with his wife because the ark and the army of God, the army of jo Joab and the rest of the army were at war. How can I enjoy the pleasures of going and spending time with my wife when, when, uh, we're, when, when we're at war right now? I'm not going to do it. He was an honorable guy. He was completely innocent. David sends him with his own death sentence. It's just a crazy thing. And then there were other soldiers that were put in danger because I'm sure Joab didn't just say, hey, you go up near the gate right underneath the wall by yourself. No, he probably sent a troop in there and a lot of other people lost their lives as a result of that. Then the babe that died was innocent as well. And um, look, uh, by the way, look over at uh, verses 11 and 12. Look what it says. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. The rape committed by Ammon and the rebellion caused by Absalom, that all comes out of this thing. It's all part of it. Not only that, we grieve God and the people that love us. Um, you know, the Bible says in 3 John, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Well, I believe the converse of that is also true. We, we have no greater sorrow than when the people we love, our children, God, you know, feels the same way about his children when they don't walk in truth, when they commit iniquity like this. Now, again, if you've already fallen, there's nothing you can do to undo the damage that you have caused, but you can determine that you will in the future be a blessing to the people around you rather than a curse. And, um, boy, I'll tell you what, it's just, it's just a lot. And, and it's, it's like we could somehow get a videotape and see the future consequences of every decision that we make. Boy, we would rethink them. But we need to just ponder passages of Scripture. And that's why, by the way, it's important, not just because, I mean, these are truths that every one of us know. On an intellectual basis, we all know these. We've all read through this passage of Scripture. We've all seen them before. But we need to be reminded. We need to think about them. We need to meditate on them. We need to kind of put ourselves in David's shoes and experience the consequences with him so that we could say to ourselves, you know what, I, I really, I'm, I'm going to pass on that because I, I, don't, I really don't want to go down the road. So we bring painful consequences to those we love, and then we do permanent damage to the cause of Christ. In verse 14, it says, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. That the worst part about this is, is we make God really look bad when we do this. You know, the lost world is just dying to see you fall because what, what that tells the lost world that out there is, is that your God is not real. 
Matter of fact, in Psalm 79, in verse 9, the Bible says, Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Why should the enemies of God say, where's your God? You don't have God. Your God's not real because he's not real in your life. And we give the enemies of God an opportunity to blaspheme the Lord. We, we do permanent damage to the cause of Christ. God's enemies win a temporary battle when we fall into sin. Listen, as God's ambassadors, it is our duty it's our privilege to magnify the Lord, to make him look good. And you've heard me say this a hundred times, but a magnifying glass doesn't make anything bigger. It just makes things look bigger. And when people look through the magnifying glass of our lives, they're supposed to see a big God, a glorious God, a wonderful God. Now, they're not supposed to see us. They're supposed to see through us and see God. As God's ambassadors, it's our privilege to make him look good to the people around us. And when we fall into sin, we not only make God's people look bad, we bring reproach to the name of Christ. Now let me say this, to those who have already fallen, get back up, dust yourself off, accept the consequences and move forward. And just remember you're in good company because all of us have fallen to one degree or another at, at some point in our life. Determine, though, that you will never let it happen again. Know that God forgives, and God has a divine forgetter. He does, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he put our sins away from us. And he remembers our sin no more, but also understand that people will most likely not forget. That's just the way it is. They're going to remember. That's okay, though. Ultimately, you only have to answer to God. Seek to improve your reputation, and more importantly, seek to improve the reputation of God by forsaking sin and fulfilling the will of God. To those of you who don't have any major blemishes on your record, stay as far away from sin as you possibly can. Be accountable to somebody. Put some fences up in your life that will help keep the devil out and also help keep you inside the uh, perfect will of God. To those of you who may be in sin but you haven't yet been caught, man, get right. Confess it to God immediately and forsake it. I believe if you confess it to God, He won't have to broadcast it to everybody else. Get help if you have to. God is merciful. God is very gracious. And He, he may not punish you if you come to Him before He has to come to you. But be sure He will eventually come to you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, we can come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, sin is a serious thing. And, you know, we're supposed to make a big deal about sin. And it used to be in our fundamental circles years and years ago, and the preachers, they were railing against sin all the time. And I'm not saying we should be screaming, hollering, and, and beating people up all the time. I'm not saying that at all. But I believe we ought to, as God's people, take a real serious look at sin and not try to get close to the line. And too many of us are trying to, we're trying to get as close to the edge of the will of God as we possibly can. And eventually, the devil's going to be right on the other side, just, just as... Joab was in the gate trying to lure Abner out of the city of refuge. The devil will be just on the other side of the wall of the will of, of will of God trying to pull you out. And eventually he's going to make it look so good and so beneficial to you that you're going to cross over and you're going to end up in disaster. And just be careful. And, uh, and, 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 and let me say this. Let's be merciful to people who have fallen. All of us have blown it a time or two, I'm sure. I know I have. Let, let's be merciful. Let's be peacemakers. Let's be people, uh, you know, spiritual people that will restore such and one in a spirit of meekness and, and recognizing that it could be us as well. And so, anyway, just a, 
just a thought from the scripture. By the way, the rest of the chapter we didn't read, and we're going verse by verse through there, but we won't take the time to do it. We get the rest of the battle of Ammon, the end of the battle. And, um, and so we see that they conquer, um, uh, we conquer, you know, the, the army conquers the Ammonites. And actually the Ammonites were in tribute to David really up until the time of Solomon. Um, I, I think it was in, in uh, Rehoboam's day that they were able to finally break free and become their own nation again. But they were like a, uh, uh, they were a tributary nation. They were in, uh, they, were, they were under the dominion of Israel all the time of David and all the time of Solomon. Um, anyway, all right, let's pray. We thank you, God, that, that you're a merciful God. And we're thankful, God, that you're a God that gives us, you know, many, many opportunities. And God, I'm thankful that you're very patient with us. And uh, you don't pound us over the head with a sledgehammer the first time we mess up. And uh, God, you're very long-suffering. But God, I pray we wouldn't take advantage of that. I pray we wouldn't think because you didn't judge our sin immediately that because that judgment didn't come, that judgment's never going to come. I pray you would help us to remember these principles that we consider tonight. I pray you'd help us to remember most of all that people are watching us and judging you based on our lives. God, I pray that we would be mindful that our whole purpose for living here on this earth is to glorify you, is to make you look good, is to represent you well, is to point people and, and whet their appetite, whet their thirst for the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, dear God, to remember that. Forgive us, God, for the things that we've done. Forgive us, God, for the things that we even think about. Help us, God, to stay far away from the edge of the will of God. Stay far away from sin. And God, I pray that you'd bless us and help us to see this. Lord, if there's somebody here tonight, whether it be in our midst here in the service or whether it be somebody watching uh, via the live stream service, God, it's my prayer that they would trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood so that we all could have eternal life. He's not willing that any should perish, but all, all should come to repentance. And uh, he came and died and bled for our sins. And he is the forgiveness of sin. And we can have our record straight with you because of what Jesus Christ did for us if we'll just trust him as Savior. And God, I pray that you would speak to the hearts of people and that they would trust Christ if they need to. I thank the Lord that 30 years ago, I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me. And it's just a blessing to be saved. I've blown it many times. I've never, I, I haven't always been what I should have been. But it's good to know that because of the blood of Christ, I'm saved and saved forever. And I'm thankful for that. And God, I pray if there's somebody that needs to be saved, whether it be here or whether it be somebody sitting at home watching this broadcast, God, I pray that they would trust Christ as Savior today. Realizing that they're a sinner, they need Christ. Christ died for them. And if they trust Jesus, Jesus will save them. God, please, we pray that you work in our hearts. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. If you're watching via the live stream and, and you made a decision, or if you want any help on the matter, there's a button on the website. It's, it says, My Response. And uh, that's just you communicating to us, letting us know whatever decisions you might have made. And um, if there's something you need help with, we can help you out at all. Um, with your journey, whether you haven't been saved yet or whether you've been saved and you just want to learn a little bit more, whatever the, your need might be. Maybe you just have something you want us to pray with you about. Then just, you know, fill out that form and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. But anyway, praise the Lord. We're glad that you guys joined us. Those of you who are with us in the service, we're glad you're here as well. It's good to have people actually in the, uh, the church house. And so thanks for coming. You're dismissed.